a justification for forecasts that accelerate warming despite a diminishing return relationship between CO2 and temperature. That justification is positive feedback. To demonstrate the co concept of positive and negative feedbacks, we've hugely inflated the budget of this film to invest in a bowl and a golf ball. Let's start with the bowl upright. When we apply a force to the golf ball, the shape of the bowl, gravity, and friction all work against the initial force to slow the golf ball and bring it back to rest in its starting position. This is negative feedback and 99% of the natural processes you can think of are ruled by negative feedback. Processes governed by negative feedback are nicely stable. Now we will flip the bowl upside down and again apply a very small force to the golf ball. This time gravity and the shape of the bowl tend to amplify the initial force. Even though I only lightly tap the ball, it ends up accelerating and rolling far away from its starting point. This is positive feedback, when forces at work tend to amplify or accelerate an input. Feedback in a microphone is a good example of positive feedback. Ominously, nuclear fission is also one. Positive feedback leads to instability and in runaway processes. And for that reason, positive feedback dominated processes are relatively rare. So what might be the key positive and negative feedbacks in the climate system? Well, for example, ice reflects a lot of sunlight back into space. So if the world warms and ice coverage melts, the reduced albedo from less ice will warm the Earth further. On the other hand, if increased evaporation leads to more cl low cloud formation, these new clouds will tend to cool the Earth and offset the warming effect. If you read the latest IPCC assessment, you will see that they assume that all these effects net to a strong positive feedback such that for every one degree Celsius in carbon dioxide driven warming positive feedbacks will add another two degrees. In their models a climate sensitivity of one from carbon dioxide acting alone becomes a three or more when carbon dioxide increases and interacts with the complex climate system. So should we worry about these positive feedbacks? Are they right? Probably not for a couple of reasons. First, remember that when we derive sensitivity using worst case assumptions, we used actual historical data. If the climate is dominated by positive feedbacks, these feedbacks should have been operating over the last hundred plus years, and we just don't see any evidence of them. The climate sensitivity of 1.2 we derived empirically should be net of feedback effects. Second, the notion of a system that has been stable for hundreds of millions or even billions of years being dominated by positive feedback should offend the intuition of any scientist. In most any discipline except climate, when scientists see a stable system, they are going to assume it is dominated by negative feedback. Yes, our climate oscillates, for example, in and out of ice ages, just like the ball in the bowl rolls around, but that is normal behavior in a stable system. A positive feedback climate would have run away to a Mars-like frigidity or a Venus-like heat eons ago under any n number of stimuli had our climate been so dominated by positive feedback. We have discussed exaggerated carbon dioxide forecasts feeding models absurdly inflated by positive feedback to generate forecasts of enormous temperature increases. These temperature forecasts become the departure point for all kinds of crazy catastrophic forecasts. Drought, floods, storms, disease, extinctions, lions, tigers, bears, oh my. But what about the good stuff? Shouldn't there be longer growing seasons in cold climates? Shouldn't there be fewer deaths from cold weather? What about more rain on average because of the greater evaporation from the oceans? But it is in the nature of the media machine to only focus on the bad news. Thirty years ago, when the panic was about global cooling rather than warming, Newsweek wrote that global cooling could, quote, cause an increase in extremes of local weather such as droughts, floods, extended dry spells, long freezes, delayed monsoons, and even local temperature increases, all of which have a direct impact on food supplies, unquote. Notice, these are all the same bad effects prophe prophesied from global warming which means that either we are balanced precariously and coincidentally on the exact best temperature for modern man where any warming or cooling whatsoever would make things worse or it means that alarmists of all ages tend to work from the same playbook.
In the remainder of this video, I will focus on just two dire prophecies, both made by Al Gore in An Inconvenient Truth. First, that warmer temperatures are already increasing severe storm frequency, and second, that global warming will cause the oceans to rise by 20 feet or more. Let's start with the storms and severe weather. In his movie, Gore said that global warming was increasing tornado frequency in the U.S. and that 2004 was the highest year on record for tornadoes. And certainly when we look at this chart of all the detected tornadoes by year, it certainly looks like a scary trend. But beyond just warming, something else happened over the last 50 years. Tornado detection technology, with Doppler radar and a better rural network for spotting and reporting tornadoes, has greatly increased. In fact, today we detect many more small tornadoes than we did in 1950. One way to correct for this measurement bias is to look at only the largest tornadoes, ones rated Category 3 to 5, which were more easily detectable with older technology. And we see that, having eliminated the measurement technology bias, tornado frequency is in fact not increasing at all. I wonder if anyone told Al Gore that. The evidence for hurricanes is harder to read, as hurricane frequency tends to follow long decadal cycles, and the detection is fraught in the early 20th century with some of the same technology-related detection problems as we saw in tornadoes. But from this chart, it's difficult to see any kind of trend that correlates with steadily increasing CO2 levels or the 20th century temperature history. While global warming may affect hurricane frequency, it is a gross simplification to say, to say simply that warmer water yields more hurricanes, because the dynamics of hurricane formation are much more complicated. When we think about hurricane frequency in the U.S., it is almost impossible not to be influenced by the fact that many of the most damaging in terms of property destruction have been in the last several decades. But in this analysis, we find that this increase is actually a function of the growth of expensive real estate on the coast, rather than hurricane intensity. When we correct for real estate values on the coast and for inflation, there is again no apparent trend in hurricane severity over the last century. 